Hello everyone, I'm Timothy Hospitalis from the University of Edinburgh and SketchX. I'm very happy to be here at this workshop to tell you about freehand sketch analysis. Since this is a virtual presentation, I stuck a photo of myself on the cover here so you can recognize me and come say hi at the next in-person event. First, I must thank my fantastic group of collaborators at SketchX with whom all of this work was done. Okay, so let's start with some background. Sketch has been growing rapidly in recent years. We got the Sketchy database in SIGGRAPH 16. We got the groundbreaking Sketch RNN synthesis model from Google at iClear 18. And there's been rapid progress on Sketch-based image synthesis. We've seen efforts on scaling up Sketch to analysis of big data sets with hashing. And we're seeing new representations for Sketch, such as transformer-based representations coming out at this very CVPR. We've got Sketch-based scene analysis coming out at this CVPR, Sketch-based shadowing coming out. And there's a long line of research on Sketch-based image retrieval from various groups, including our own SketchX, where we've got an RL at this CVPR. So with that background, um, here's the outline of my talk. I'll go through several different kinds of Sketch analysis applications. I'll mostly focus on SketchX work, but also mention a lot of other great work along the way. Before we dive in, I want to mention a bit about Sketch representations. So a fascinating thing about Sketch is the diversity of possible representations compared to photos. Historically, sketches were treated like raster images, uh, dense arrays of pixels. Um, but with digitally collected sketches nowadays, we can treat sketches as vector images, we can treat them as graphs or as sequences of points. And we'll see different representations being used as we discuss different applications. So what are the different kinds of analysis tasks we want to perform on sketches? The first thing that we can try to do is simply recognize the depicted objects. So here is an example of sketch recognition. I recorded myself playing with Google Quick Draw earlier today, and you can see me trying to draw different objects, in this case a diving board, which Quick Draw eventually recognizes. Here I am again, trying to draw a train, not very well. Uh, but eventually, after I add enough strokes, Google Trick Quick Draw eventually recognizes it. So, what's different about sketch recognition compared to photo recognition? Um, one thing is in photos, we've got dense pixel grids. In sketches, as we said, there's uh, sparse pixel arrays. In photos, it's normally a static array of pixels. In sketch, we may have temporal or sequence information depending on how it's recorded. Um, and photos, again, are raster images, whereas sketches may be vector images. And so one of the first works that uh, analyzed all of these different issues for the purpose of sketch recognition uh, was our own sketch net. And this is ages ago now um, in BMVC 15, but it was pretty well received at the time. And so what we were aiming to do in this piece of work was to recognize sketches, exploiting the fact that they were vector images and uh, exploiting the fact that we had temporal information. So to this end, we took the sketch, decomposed it into different segments using the fact that the source was a vector source and that we had temporal information so we could decompose segments of the sketch by time. And then we fed each of these into uh, CNN branches and um, eventually classified the sketch that way. And so we were the first to beat human performance on the TU Berlin dataset. And um, since then, many works have gone on to do much better than this. Um, one thing we didn't do here, uh, but which is an obvious thing to do for sketch recognition, is to exploit both vector and raster representations. So here, although we exploited the vector source, uh, we used the normal uh, pixel CNN to uh, analyze the image, um, but subsequent work has worked on fusing vector representations of the sketch with dense pixel representations of the sketch as processed by CNN. So fast forward to today, 
uh, lots of work has been done on sketch recognition, but just to look at one uh, nice representative recent one, um, we can see things like um, recurrent models being used to analyze the sketch step by step as a sequence, exploiting the uh, temporal recording of the sketch in this case. And also things like um, recognizing the sketch by predicting the word vector that describes it. So in this way, we can try to do somewhat more open world recognition by predicting uh, word embeddings rather than by predicting a small closed set of categories. Okay, so that's a bit of uh, early and recent work on sketch recognition. Um, moving on, other more interesting kinds of analysis we may want to do with sketches include segmentation, grouping, and parsing. So what do I mean by that? Um, semantic segmentation or unsupervised segmentation are very established in photo analysis. Um, in sketches, we want to do something similar. So maybe we've got some sketch images like this and we want to segment so we know like which strokes belong to the saucer and which strokes be belong to the cup. So this could be a semantic segmentation problem. So back in ECCV18, um, we proposed what might be the first deep model for doing this kind of task. Um, and there is a sketch perceptual grouping data set. We see some results here where we can do things like group parts of objects such as the windows and door and body and roof of the house into um, different semantic parts. So how did that work? Well, we had um, here we use the sketch represented as a sequence of points. And so we use a bidirectional RNN as the encoder to embed the sketch and then um, do some sketch reconstruction as a regularizer. But then the main learning objective is to calculate the pairwise distances between um, each stroke in the sketch. So then we can try to group together matching strokes uh, that belong to the same semantic part and separate mismatching strokes that belong to different parts. And so here's some results. We can of course treat this problem as a photo problem, ignore the fact that it's a sketch and just run a state-of-the-art photo segmentation model like DeepLab, or we can use our sketch segmentation model uh, and we get some much nicer results like this in terms of RAND index of the segmentation. So um, going forward to more recent work, as I said at the start, uh, when we have got sketches represented in vector format, there's various different ways we can think about um, modeling them. So uh, in the previous work I showed, we thought about modeling the sketch as a sequence. So we modeled it with the RNN. Um, we can also think about modeling the sketch as a graph. And if we think about modeling the sketch as a graph, it's natural to process it with graph convolutional networks. And so some cool recent work came out doing just that. And by modeling the sketch as a graph um, with graph convolutional networks for doing segmentation, uh, they get pretty nice results in quite challenging sketches, segmenting the arms and legs and eyes of different animals and so on, um, where our previous segmentation model made mistakes. Okay, so what else has been going on in this direction? Um, there's also going beyond part segmentation. Uh, we've got new data sets nowadays for object segmentation and scenes. So uh, if you have some great ideas for how to do these kind of more uh, complicated segmentation tasks for sketches, um, you can feel free to come and try it out on the sketchy scene data set. Adjacent to segmentation, we also have problems like sketch parsing, which rather than uh, labeling particular edges and in sketches into semantic parts, the goal is to label the pixels that are enclosed by um, different edges into semantic parts. And uh, so this is something which there's been work going on for a while. Okay, so that's recognition, segmentation, grouping, parsing, and um, 
a rather more understudied topic, which I find quite fascinating, is the idea of sketch abstraction. So what do I mean by abstraction? We can imagine that when we sketch an object, it's like an abstraction of the real world. So we go from a dense pixel photo image like this to a, a detailed line drawing like this. We have left out some detail. But if we think about the space of drawings, we can also have a more abstract drawing like this that leaves out an increasing amount of detail compared to this one, or an even more abstract drawing like this that becomes quite iconic, leaving out detail compared to this one. And so if we think about the process of going from this side to this side as generating increasingly abstract images, we can imagine, um, so this is something which is easy for a human to do, but we can imagine that it's an interesting research question to see whether we can get a machine to do this kind of abstraction automatically. So uh, this is something that we've worked on a little bit and um, how we thought about doing it to start with is abstraction just by removing some strokes to start with rather than completely resynthesizing the image. So the idea is that given a complete sketch like this, we want to train an abstraction engine that will output the best abstracted version of that sketch. So if we imagine just outputting the kind of contour of the face, that's probably like a little too abstract. And so what the abstraction engine is going to do is he's going to step by step tell which stroke uh, he wants to keep uh, to generate the kind of minimal number of strokes that still convey the idea of the sketch. So he's going to input the abstraction so far and the complete sketch and um, propose the next stroke. So maybe the next stroke he proposes is the air of this cat. And then what we will do is we will feed the proposed sketch so far to a pre-trained sketch recognizer. The sketch recognizer will check for the, try to recognize the correct category of cat. And if it recognizes it correctly, it will give a reward to the abstraction engine. So maybe so far it's not correctly recognized, so no reward. So the abstraction engine suggests to output another stroke, which is the second air. And we carry on like this uh, until the sketch is completed. But what happens is the abstraction engine will get more reward if it manages to generate a recognizable sketch earlier in this sequence of strokes. And so in this way, we can train the abstraction engine by reinforcement learning to try to produce the simplest sketch, which is still recognizable, which in this case is this one here. <clears throat> so here we formulated the abstraction problem as one of stroke selection. Um, and the subset selection problem is a combinatorial problem. Uh, and so we address that with reinforcement learning here to tractably solve the combinatorial problem. Um, one interesting thing about this way of thinking about abstraction, which is certainly not the only way to think about it, but an interesting thing about it is that you can define um, what is salient about a sketch, so what should be kept uh, in a task specific way. So here our task was based on category recognition, but as I'll show in a sec, we can uh, have different definitions of salience. So what can we do with this abstraction engine? Well, one thing we can do is to um, use it to measure stroke saliency. So if we feed a sketch into the engine and it wants to output those strokes first, because those strokes are important to recognize the category, then um, we can see, for example, that in the case of a fire engine, the typical ladder that's on the top of a fire engine is important for it to be recognized. So that stroke is of high saliency. What else can we do? So I said that we can choose the goal for the use in this kind of abstraction engine. So one thing we can do, for example, is choose whether we abstract based on uh, category, as I showed before, or some other metadata. So for example, we have got a data set where there are attributes assigned to different categories, so, uh, or, or different images. And then if we tune the abstraction to focus on category versus attribute, we get slightly different abstractions. So if we ask it to abstract while preserving recognizability of cat, 
we keep the airs and if we ask it to abstract while preserving recognizability of the attributes in this case whiskers it keeps the whiskers and similarly if we take this owl image here we can abstract to focus on the wings which convey the category of it or we can abstract to focus on the eyes which convey uh, the attribute of him having big eyes <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, this is a line of work we did um, in CVPR 18 and 19. And uh, actually this abstraction idea can be applied both to sketches as well as to um, other things like videos and texts as well. Okay, so um, coming back to some other topics, one of the um, main things I'm sure everyone knows about is sketch generation and the reason this one is quite famous uh, is because of the excellent piece of work done by Google back in iClear 18 uh, for sketch generation uh, known as sketch RNN. So um, just to recap in case someone hasn't come across this piece of work, uh, the idea is to train a generative model for sketches and so they do this by taking a data set of human sketches that were collected from uh, quick draw, as I showed um, at the beginning, and uh, then train a sequence to sequence variational autoencoder to reconstruct those sketches. And given the trained autoencoder, they can use that to sample new sketches. So, because the sketches here are modeled as sequences of waypoints, then both the encoder and the decoder of this uh, variational autoencoder are. Uh, sequential models. So what can you do with this? Um, as for the generative models of images, it's really interesting to observe the kind of latent space interpolations you get. So you can interpolate, for example, from this kind of cat to this kind of cat, or from a left-facing fire engine to a right-facing fire engine, etc. You can also use this kind of model for sketch completion. So you can start, for example, with two bubbles for eyes like this and have it generate different kinds of owls that might fit those eyes. So that's uh, unconditional sketch generation. Um, one thing we've worked on recently is photo to sketch generation. So if I'm uh, seeing a photo in the real world, I can um, kind of render my mental image of that photo as a sketch and the question is can we ask a computer to do the same? What would the computer draw um, to represent their interpretation of that sketch? Uh, of that photo, sorry. So uh, to investigate this we collected some photos and some human drawings of those photos uh, recorded as sequences of strokes again and uh, so we can see the human might draw this photo, for example, um, step by step uh, in this order here. And then we train a, a sequential decoder to input this photo and output the sequence of strokes to kind of simulate the sorts of human drawings that it sees. So the idea um, is somewhat analogous to the sketch RNN we saw before. We input the photo and there is an encoder CNN who generates the initial state for a um, LSTM decoder and then he's going to generate um, each of the strokes step by step to try and uh, synthesize the sketch that matches the target sketch uh, that the human made uh, in the data collection. So there's some details for um, how to make this work, uh, lots of shortcut connections and um, cycle consistency. Uh, go check out the paper if you want to know all the details. Um, but the main interesting thing is how it really works in practice. So we can actually see it in action now. So what we've done here is to input a photo and what we see here is uh, the computer trying to draw the photo. So we can see he draws the outlines very quickly um, and then spends a lot of time struggling to badly reproduce the laces of this shoe. Similarly, 
got another shoe like this of a different style uh, and this is the attempt to sketch it in vector graphic format. We can do the same with chairs instead of shoes. We can see step by step drawing the back of the chair, the seat of the chair, and then the legs one by one. Okay, so that's a sketch generation of various kinds. One of the major other research directions has been um, sketch-based image retrieval of various kinds. So sketch-based image retrieval uh, has been around for decades. Um, the most classic way to think about it has been uh, with the view of like, okay, I want to retrieve bicycles, so I draw a bicycle and then I hopefully get a lot of bicycle images. Or if I want to retrieve horses, I draw a horse and hopefully get horse images and no Eiffel Tower images. Um, so this kind of sketch-based image retrieval really focuses on categories. So you draw a horse, you want to get any horse, you don't necessarily care which horse. So one thing that we've been promoting is the notion of fine-grained sketch-based image retrieval. So for the category level retrieval, um, maybe you could equally do the same thing with kind of tags on the image or keywords or by training an image category recognizer. So our view is that the killer app for this kind of sketch to image retrieval technology is fine-grained. So you can imagine you are trying to do some shopping, you imagine a particular product you want, you try to draw the product including the details of the buckle that you are imagining you would like the look of, and then you retrieve that among some products. And so now we are trying to retrieve one particular image rather than any image of the category shoe. So a little bit more detail why this might be a good thing to do. If you are trying to imagine retrieving a chair that looks like this, if this is your mental image, trying to explain that chair in terms of keywords or text queries is a bit of a pain because um, you have this problem of uh, things like you want an H shape or you want no hand rests, you don't want wheels, etc. All of these things are a bit hard to convey in terms of text or keywords, but you can possibly sketch them more easily than you can explain them verbally. So um, this is something we've been working on for a while um, using the pipeline, which is now quite established. Um, but when we proposed it in CVPR 16, the idea was to have a um, three branch CNN who inputs a sketch photo uh, that matches the sketch and the non matching photo. And then they should all be embedded in a way that makes them comparable. And um, you train a triplet loss so that the matching photo comes out with a similar embedding to the sketch and the mismatching photo comes out with a different embedding to the sketch. And so the challenge here is if you just try to compare these things directly, they are hard to compare because the alignment isn't there. Um, the modalities look very different. But after using triplet loss to train the CNNs, uh, they should be directly comparable. And one of the ongoing debates about this kind of thing is whether these CNNs should be um, Siamese or heterogeneous. Um, I think the answer to that is a bit application dependent, depends on what kind of data you have. So uh, how does it work in practice? Yeah. So how does it work in practice? Here's a demo we had previously. Um, this is a recording of me trying to draw a particular kind of shoe that I might imagine. And then um, you can see it's gone away and retrieved different kinds of shoes. And the more similar shoes with this style of buckler at the top of the list and the unrelated shoes uh, are at the back of the list. Another example, different kind of shoe. And uh, we can go out and retrieve different kinds of strappy lady shoes like that. Alternatively, we could imagine doing it for different kinds of couches. We draw a nice round couch with buttons on it like this, and then go away and retrieve similar couches at the front of the list. Or if we go further down the list, you can see we get to things which are totally unrelated. So this is the idea. Um, we're trying to find things which uh, within category, um, but 
look like the specific instance which we searched for. As an example again for different kinds of uh, backpacks. Okay, so this is kind of classic work now. So what's been going on since then? Um, so as with many things in deep learning, uh, adding different kinds of attention modules can be useful to improve the retrieval accuracy. Um, we can also do some kind of metric learning. You can imagine um, when we train a normal uh, learning to rank model, we might do some kind of Euclidean distance for retrieval, but we can uh, learn some kind of higher order comparisons um, that compare across different features analogous to Mahalanobis distance. And to deal with the large number of parameters here, this can be like a low rank tensor fusion, for example. Um, what else has been going on? If we want to scale this to real applications where there's millions of photo images rather than thousands of photo images, we might not be able to compute nearest neighbor um, matches exhaustively. So another whole line of research has been doing this kind of sketch-based image retrieval with hashing. So we can generate discrete hashing codes for efficient matching. And uh, the tricky part about this is, is backpropagating through these kind of discrete variables that represent the hash code of your images. So um, what else is new? So most of the fine grain image retrieval work uh, at the start was looking at within categories. So I train on shoes and I test on shoes. But you can imagine this is kind of a annoying thing, annoying constraint to have if you really want to use this. You might first have shoes in your database and then later on you want to know if you can use the model to retrieve chairs if you, for example, add a new product to your catalog. And the question is, will this work or not? So from a mach machine learning perspective, this is like a kind of domain shift. So you train your model with data of these statistics and you test it on data with these statistics. And so there's been a whole bunch of works in the last few years coming up with different ways to kind of um, make sketch-based image retrieval more uh, robust to this kind of cross-category testing. But um, I think in general, because it's an example of a domain shift problem, there's a lot of techniques from the domain generalization and domain adaptation communities in machine learning that we can draw to improve performance in this kind of setting. Another question um, is about how to pre-train these models. So um, for all of these kind of CNN-based models, uh, we tend to not have enough plain SPIR data to train the model from scratch because SPIR data requires matched pairs of photos and sketches, uh, which are hard to collect. So most of the work goes around pre-training these branches um, with ImageNet data. And uh, so one thing we looked at actually coming out of this CVPR is whether we can remove that ImageNet pre-training step. So instead, what we did is self-supervised pre-training. So we took images, um, got out edge maps, and then turned, shuffled the, the, chopped them up into squares and shuffled the squares, and then trained a jigsaw puzzle solver to unshuffle the squares. And so with this kind of mixed modality jigsaws, we were able to do a, a pre-training for SPIR that actually no longer needs ImageNet. So that's kind of faster and more accurate, um, leads to more accurate SPIR models than the kind of conventional pre-training. And the, yeah, the, the interesting technical thing about this was um, if this jigsaw puzzle solver is implemented as um, with sync on iterations, this can be uh, much more effective than just training it as a multi-class classification problem, which is sometimes done for these kind of jigsaws. Um, another topic uh, in this direction is whether the retrieval is performed offline, so you complete the whole sketch and then retrieve, or whether it's performed online, so you retrieve in an ongoing way as you sketch. So we've got a paper coming out this CVPR that um, looks at exactly this. So basically what happens is we've got a two branch network as usual. One branch processes the sketch, another branch processes the photo. And then what we are gonna to try to do is to, uh, to do some reinforcement learning with a reward that encourages early retrieval. So if we are imagining sketching this chair one stroke at a time, 
we want to hopefully retrieve the correct image as early as possible in terms of number of strokes. So um, you can imagine the user like sketches their item to retrieve uh, piece by piece, and then hopefully the retrieval um, is activated somewhere earlier on in the sketch. And uh, yeah, the results show we can retrieve uh, most objects with significantly fewer strokes than the baseline by training this kind of model with reinforcement learning. So here's some graphs about um, the resulting uh, rank of the retrieval and how much of the sketch is completed. So um, there is a pretty solid improvement in early retrieval with this kind of training method. So besides image retrieval, another thing one can think about doing is video retrieval. So um, one thing we thought about is whether we can like present a small stack of frames that correspond, um, well, a small stack of sketches that correspond to different frames within a video, and then use those sequence of sketches to retrieve a video that has these sequence of activities. So in this case, we were looking at figure skating videos where the um, sketch kind of indicates the pose, and then we annotated it with some arrows to indicate the expected direction at that moment. And so there's some challenges here. We need to both model like the match and appearance between the modalities as well as the match between motion and the modalities. And there is a big weekly supervised learning problem because when we collect data like this, um, it's quite laborious to collect anyway. So we want to, uh, we don't want to have to annotate which particular frames one sketch corresponds to. So there is a latent variable in this learning problem that tries to um, unpack the frame to sketch correspondence. So uh, how did we do it? We did a fairly typical setup for video retrieval where we've got an appearance path that matches the appearance of the sketch to the apparent stream of a um, video CNN and the motion path that matches the kind of motion annotation to the motion stream. And then actually the hardest part to deal with was this weekly supervised frame matching. So for any one sketch, there is a range of frames it could correspond to and uh, solving that latent variable um, during the learning with standard weekly supervised learning techniques. And so the result is you can put in a sketch or set of sketches and retrieve the corresponding video and even retrieve the individual frames uh, which a particular sketch corresponds to. Okay, so finally, um, sketch is a photo substitute. Uh, what do I mean by that? A few things. Um, so one thing we can use sketch for is a way to benchmark model robustness. So in um, computer vision in general, object recognition and so on, we are always trying to make robust features that generalize to different kinds of data. And so we can imagine when we train our object recognition models on different kinds of photos, we can then find out really how robust they are by holding out um, very different sketch images as a kind of test modality. And recognizing sketches is totally easy for humans, but recognizing sketches given a model that's trained only on photos is pretty tricky for CNNs. And so treating sketches as a kind of out of domain benchmark for recognition is a really cool direction. Um, another way to think about sketch as a photo substitute is whether we can use sketch to avoid laborious data collection for photos. So can I, for example, draw a sketch of a dog and use that to synthesize a photo classifier for dog in order to save um, photo collection effort? So um, this is something we worked on a little while ago as a model regression problem. So um, by model regression, what I mean is we train, say, a photo classifier to differentiate some categories such as dog balloon, and we train a sketch classifier to do the same, and then we regress the sketch classifier onto the photo classifier. Um, and now we can do the same, and so we do that for some training categories where we've got both sketches uh, and photos, and then for testing categories, we now say, okay, let me draw a cat and see if I can use that to regress onto a photo uh, classifier for cats. And so 
uh, in that way we can generate photo classifiers without ever seeing photo images. And so this is something which is turns out to be kind of analogous to word vector based zero shot learning, which is a very popular topic in computer vision recently. Um, but rather than relying on the nameability of the category you want to recognize, it kind of relies on the depictability of the category you want to recognize. And sometimes things are easier to name, other times they are hard to name but easy to depict. Okay, great. So that's a bit of a whirlwind tour of sketch analysis. Um, in terms of outlook going forward, the things I'm most excited about are exploiting interesting representations for sketches. So there's a lot of fascinating work coming out in terms of treating sketches as graphs or modeling sketches with transformers rather than the typical like um, dense pixels uh, and using CNNs to model them. I think there's a lot to be done on reinforcement learning based training of sketch models. I've shown a few examples about that. And in terms of applications, uh, sketch abstraction is still a very open problem. Sketch to photosynthesis still only barely works, so there's a lot of work to be done there. And sketch as an interaction modality for other tasks is a fascinating topic, which um, there's papers coming out about uh, the CVPR as well. And with that, I'll finish there. Thanks for listening and look forward to see you at the Q&A.